there are spoilers later on in this video. Consult the spoiler chart if you don't want to be spoiled. Also, this script was written and recorded before Byleth was shown for Smash Ultimate and before the fan fiction y Mole People DLC was announced. So it turns out, Fire Emblem Three Houses is a. Uh, is, is a pretty good game. Which is surprising, since leading up to the release, I honestly thought this game was gonna be bad. I saw the first couple trailers with a really bad song that everyone else seems to like, and I was like, What the heck? Is this game gonna be fucking Harry Potter anime Persona High School? And your self-insert character is a teacher at the school? Are you gonna be able to fuck the student? But then a month before the game came out, they released the final trailer slightly spoiling the game, saying, Hey! We have an actual plot, and it turns out it's a pretty good plot. And you can't bone the students until after they graduated. Incest is alright, but a teacher sleeping with their students is where intelligence systems draws the line. For those who don't know, Fire Emblem is a strategy RPG series that takes place in a high fantasy setting. It's swords and magic versus dragons and gods. The battles are like 12 dimensional chess, and then your units talk to each other and stuff between the fights. It's a series where all the anime swordsmen and Smash Brothers are from. Fire Emblem Three Houses is the 16th mainline entry in the series. In this game, in the first half you're a teacher at a military academy at a church? For royalty and future knights from across the continent. In the second half of the game, mild spoiler but not really, some time passes and all your former students are trying to kill each other. <laughs> Whoops! Even though most people know me from the Squid Game, Fire Emblem is literally my favorite video game series of all time. And despite the clickbaity thumbnail that I probably went with, get used to that in 2020, I have played pretty much every Fire Emblem game, even the Japan only ones. Given all that, I'm here to say that in terms of quality of game, Fire Emblem Three Houses is the best Fire Emblem game. It's not my personal favorite Fire Emblem game, that goes to the first one released in America because nostalgia. Even though when I first played it, I sucked at the game because I was like 11 when it came out. And that final chapter is one of the biggest difficulty spikes my prepubescent eyes ever faced. But Three Houses doesn't have that because other than Manding Mode, which is still pretty balls to the wall, chop yo dick off difficult, Three Houses is one of the easier Fire Emblem games. However, there is enough challenge to keep the player engaged. The gameplay is the most accessible it's ever been to newcomers, however, there is a ton of depth in the mechanics for series veterans. You see, ever since Fire Emblem Awakening on the 3DS, the Fire Emblem fan base is more or less composed of two halves. People who like strategy games slash RPG games, and weebs. There, there's a lot of overlap here, and they don't always get along, apparently. Fire Emblem Three Houses was able to unite the fan base by pleasing both sides. You like strategy? where you got a metric butt ton of stratego in this game. Personal skills, learning skills, choosing right skills, unit optimization, combat arts to equip, battalions and gamuts to use at the right time, agitants to just kinda stand there, class changing, new game plus, divine pulse, so you, if you fuck up you don't have to redo the whole chapter. You have so many options to play the game how you want to. You like weeb shit? Well you got tea parties with your students, cooking with your students, meals with your students, maid outfits? A sauna? and a fuck ton of support conversations aren't just like two static images flapping their lips. The characters have movements and different camera angles and they talk in front of backgrounds look like they've been squeezed into a fishbowl. Speaking of the characters, they're all very well written and not gimmicky. Well, some of them start out as kind of gimmicky. <coughs> Lawrence, <coughs> Raphael. But a ton of depth comes out through the support conversations and through the character development that happens throughout the plot. This is probably the best cast of characters in any Fire Emblem game. Even though there are a couple of uh, repeat characters in terms of their archetype that they serve in the story. Demure holy women. Horsey boys who think they're God's gift to women. Opera singers desperate for a husband. Hyper devoted second in commands. I love Chris. Stan Rhea. Forgettable small archer boys. However, even if some of them might be a little similar, they're all unique enough to fill out the main cast. Not to mention, it's the most diverse cast in any Fire Emblem game. Multiple people of color. One of them is even on the cover. I can't believe we made it. I can't believe we made it. And the writing and voice acting is probably some of the best I've heard in literally any video game ever. Sad moments are sad, intriguing moments are intriguing. Funny moments are intentionally funny. The jokes actually land in this one. Why don't we do what our ancestors did and have a little duel ourselves? That's what you were going to say. But the answer is no. You have a gut, Professor. I will take great joy from your teachings. Petra, I believe you mean to say that our Professor has guts. But if it's something silly like, my ancestors were cursed, therefore I'm cursed, you should know that I won't accept that nonsense. Ador, 
Sorrow, like a needle point. Bernie's gone away. Bernadetta? A word of caution. How would you feel if you fell or bumped into someone while carrying around that needle? Please watch where you're going in the future. How did you manage to faint while standing up? The only minor downside is that, due to the nature of the story, some characters have their character development happen entirely off-screen. However, when that happens, it's interesting to see how they've grown. Except for you, Felix. Fuck you, Felix! You're the worst character in this game. You start the game an asshole, and then you end the game less of one, but still an asshole. You're not even that good of a unit. I benched you in two playthroughs, and I killed your ass in the third. Your shitty shield heroes relic sucks donkey doo doo, and even though you're a dead dairy one, you get all the fan art, and all the girls still love you. Just like real life. But all joking aside, even though I really wasn't joking about Felix, fuck you Felix, there's a ton of nuance and layers within each character. No one is truly right, but no one is truly wrong either. But if you, I don't know, play the game and play each route, every character's motivations make sense, especially given what they've all been through in their history. Their actions, of course, can be subject to criticism. This next sentence is for a very select group of people, especially some headasses I've seen in Twitter replies. There's a ton of nuance within each character, so simply reducing a character down to a one-word description, such as, this character is a womanizer, or that character is a fascist, is being willfully ignorant of the hundreds of pages of dialogue each character has in this script, and that type of thinking is literally how stereotypes exist in real life to this day. And each character has proficiencies in improving their weapon ranks that suit their personality, and each character will lean more towards certain classes, but you can choose to make any character any class. I've always thought that a unit's class is part of their identity, so I wasn't a huge fan of how in some of the recent games you can just make anyone any class, but this system feels like the perfect balance between player customization and unit individuality. Recruiting characters still take strategy, just a different type than in some of the previous games. What else is strategy other than meaningful decisions and optimizing your resources? So instead of trying to position your units so that one character can talk to another mid-battle like in the previous FE games, instead you have to manage your professor points and items to meet characters' skill preference guidelines if you want a certain unit to join you. Here's the hot take. I know a lot of people want to recruit every character, or at least as many as possible, so that later in the game, you don't have to kill as many characters that you know. But I'd wager that not recruiting gives the story more impact. Friends fighting former friends, caught on the wrong side of the war, has way more impact than, well I had a bunch of tea parties with y'all, so no murder for anyone, now get on the bench for the rest of the game. You even get to see some characters' deep reactions to having to go through this, which is one of the themes of the game's story. There are no winners in war, just survivors. The bridge was full of soldiers, and they all died, and Ferdy was there. We killed Ferdy, Professor, he used to be our friend. Do you remember those days? Yeah, but what about the music? The music is amazing. I know, right? Grass is green, sky is blue, water is wet, and Fire Emblem still has good music. Even the bad Fire Emblem game has good music. It's one of those games where every song is really good and fits the atmosphere really well. There are so many bangers in this soundtrack. Music does the seamless transition thing like the 3DS games do, sliding between map theme and combat theme. Except instead of transitioning to a newer, more exciting version of the song with different instrumentation. In Three Houses, it goes to a version of the song where it sounds like someone is just banging on pots and pans in the background.
but what's the story like? In vague terms, there are three, no, sorry, four storylines that all have more or less the same first half of the story, but will vary dialogue depending on which house you choose to teach at the start of the game, and the second half of the story varies wildly between houses. It lends itself really well to multiple playthroughs, and it's a good example of how a game developer can make good use of repeated content. The levels are all the same in the first half, but the dialogue is different since it's different characters talking, and it really makes for a good story. Not to mention each house has their own unique scenes in the first half. The last time Fire Emblem had a good story was... Almost... Hell no. Eh. No. No. These ones! So like, ten years ago. In three houses I played the roots in this order, and I regret doing that, and I highly recommend playing them in this order instead, or at least definitely play Golden Deer first. I still haven't played Silver Snow yet because A, I'm waiting for the rest of the DLC classes to come out before I play this game for a fourth time. I heard that there's some new classes coming out, including one that finally lets girls punch. And B, I've heard that Silver Snow is basically Golden Deer, but worse. So I'll probably play that one on Maddening, but New Game Plus since you don't have an OP house leader on your team. And I don't care about having a slightly different colored title screen for beating Maddening mode on a fresh playthrough. I will now talk about each story in depth, so if you haven't played one and don't want to be spoiled, then mute this video while you see the icon of the story I'm talking about in the top right of the screen. First route I played was Crimson Flower, which is more or less the Edelgard quote unquote secret route, and I didn't know it existed until I was on it. I got here completely on accident, and I wish I hadn't played it first honestly. The game takes a very sharp turn in terms of tone and a bit of a dive in quality. The moment Edelgard got crowned Emperor, I feel like I was playing a completely different game. In this story, you team up with Edelgard to fight the church who are sort of evil? Oh no, it's complicated. It definitely feels like this was meant to be a secret bonus route, not done on a first playthrough. I feel like it was written in such a way that the game assumes you already know what happens from another point of view. For example, when the time skip battle happens, there's no cutscene at the end. The screen just cuts to black and then you just reappear five years later. There's no explanation. It's really bizarre and I was very confused. But in the other routes, there's a cutscene here explaining what happens. A lot of the boss characters show up with no explanation of who they are, only for those characters to be, like, really important in the other routes. The game just kind of assumed you already know who they are. A lot of Slava dies off screen, and during Randolph's death, the screen just awkwardly fades to black mid-sentence. In fact, at multiple points, the game just kind of cuts to something else, like there was supposed to be a cutscene or battle or something there, and instead there's nothing. Like when Edelgard reveals herself to be the Flame Emperor and Rhea transforms, the game just cuts to your team already having ran away to some random fortress. And the story itself really wasn't that interesting. Edelgard, with Professor's guidance, makes the incredibly obvious decision of not fighting two countries at once, and instead you dunk on Claude, dunk on Dimitri, then dunk on Rhea twice. That's it, that's the story. It's a similar idea to like Fire Emblem Fates Conquest, and that you're conquering instead of defending, except Crimson Flower is way less stupid than Fates. Let's invade this country so that our clearly evil dad can sit on a magic chair, so that we'll know if he's evil or not. What a stupid fucking game. Anyway, there aren't really any interesting developments or twists or turns to the story of Crimson Flower to keep me on the edge of my seat wanting to know what happens next. Edelgard just wins. A lot. That's the game. The only story related thing that kept me going was Edelgard's and the Professor's budding relationship at the monastery between chapters. It was really cute watching them grow closer together. Uh, I mean, Wyvern Lords, Monster Trucks, Tool Belt. As for the other Black Eagles house characters, they don't develop much after the time skip or have much of an impact on the story compared to the other routes. We follow Edelgard because we think she's right. That's it. I mean, I mean, Hubert's less creepy, Burndett is more confident, but that's about it. I also didn't recruit very many units from other houses in my first run because... I didn't want to. I knew I was going to play the other routes anyway. I got Marianne because I wanted a second healer with Linhart, and I recruited Shamir, Sylvain, and Manuela completely by accident, and I let Lysithia join in the second half. But even though I only vaguely remembered a lot of the characters from the first half of the game, I still felt bad for killing a lot of the former students. Ignaz is literally the most forgettable playable character in this game, and he's the first one you kill! But with the sad music really hamming up the moment, I legit felt bad for killing him. I should have known this would happen. So I was a little bit disappointed by this route, especially because it was my first playthrough. And not to mention, it's the only route where Edelgard doesn't fucking die. However, now that my expectations are properly set, I'll probably eventually replay this one, especially because I beat it before the Death Knight was available as a free DLC unit. He gets talked about a little bit, 
but he just isn't seen for the rest of the game. Developmentally, this route felt a little rushed or unfinished. It's 4-5 to five chapters shorter than all the other routes, and the Slither people, who are the real bad guys of the whole game, you fight off screen during the credits. Also, the final chapter fucking sucks if you're like me and don't have any flyers on your team. This is an absolute slog to play through. At the same time I did my normal mode Black Eagles Crimson Flower route at home, I was streaming my entire Blue Lions Azure Moon hard mode route on my Twitch. Twitch.tv slash Lieutenant Spaceman. Shit, that would have been a way cooler name. No, no one take that, I got dibs. Also, I forgot to save most of the footage and tweet deletes old streams, so... Whoops! <laughs> this route took me a while to finish, since I was streaming it on weekends in the morning, but it's definitely a more compelling story than Black Eagles. Even in the pre-time skip, Blue Lion's characters have a closer connection to what's happening in the chapters. Ash is Lenato's adopted son, Sylvain is Miklon's brother, Gilbert is Annette's long-lost father, Dimitri and Edelgard have a bond that Edelgard did not mention once in her route, whoops, and seeing Dimitri's transformation and redemption throughout the game kept me wanting to see what happens next. In this story, Edelgard has dethroned Dimitri, and he's real mopey about it, so he and his old friends team up with the Knights of Saros and fight Edelgard. But yet again, all the stuff with the Slither people and all the stuff with the church is just like, explained away in one sentence. I get it's the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, but the Knights of Saros just instantly rejoin you post time skip, And you save Rhea during the credits, she's not even on screen for it, and there's one line before the final battle about the Slither people just kind of hanging out there. But other than that, it's a good route. The third route I did was Golden Deer Verdant Wind on Hard Mode New Game Plus, so I kind of sped through a lot of it. Claw is my favorite house leader of the three, but the rest of his house members I was initially very ew on, but they all grew on me over time. Even Lawrence! And this route, you team up with Claude, his old friends, and the Knights of Saros to fight Edelgard. Then you fight the Slither people. Then you fight the guy who showed up during the first cutscene. This was the route that actually felt complete, with questions and foreshadowing set up in the first half of the game actually getting answered and paying off in the second half. You defeat all the antagonists set up in the first half, not to mention all the exclusive paralogues you get, explain the lore of the world better, and subtly explaining what the fuck's going on with Flane and why she doesn't age. There were a lot of repeated chapters between Blue Lions and Golden Deer post time skip, which was a little disappointing. In fact, the first two thirds of Golden Deer is just Blue Lions without the angst. Also, the Grounder Field rematch in both Azure Moon and Verdant Wind is real dumb and poorly set up. Fargus and Leicester armies have literally no reason to fight each other, but the game won in its big three-way set-piece battle, and the enemy AI will still go straight for you. We trying to ally ourselves with them since we have the same enemy, but they didn't reply, so we have to kill them. What? But that also goes into why I say not recruiting has way more emotional impact than just recruiting everyone so you don't have to kill anyone. If you don't recruit the Blue Lion students in Grounder Field, the Dimitri, who was thought to be dead, shows up with all the help of his childhood friends to take back his country and get revenge, and they all fucking die? Now that's good tragedy right there. So yeah, that's it for spoilers, pretty much. Every route is good, but some are better than the others. Golden Deer feels like it was the initial route, with Azure Moon and Silver Snow are just variations of that, and Crimson Flower just feels like a tacked on bonus route. I am really glad there's no canon route where everyone ends up happy and smiling and best buds together, since that would go against the themes the story is clearly displaying, and I really hope they don't add a DLC happy ending route either. There is no 100% happy ending, that's the whole point. Other than what you previously mentioned, what else didn't you like about the game or what are the things that could be improved on? Again, this is a very good game, but I'm going to be critical when I need to be. First off, the animations. The standard battle animations are really good, but the animations for combat arts are kinda underwhelming since they're all mostly the same no matter who's attacking with what technique. Granted, that would be a lot to animate, especially considering that pretty much any class can use pretty much any weapon, but a little variation would have been nice. Instead, most of them are FLASH, and then a slightly stronger attack than normal. It was a little disappointing considering that in the last Effie game, we got Alm sending Rudolph back in time with his special attack. The second half of the game is worse. In all three routes I played, the second half of the game is always not as good as the first half, especially the monastery phases. Since there's no one else to recruit, and at this point you've had a dozen or so chapters unlocking all the features, so other than talking to each character for the commentary on what's happening, the weekend monastery portion just become pump full of meals and grind out weapon and support levels. It would have been nice if more characters had joined you in the second half, specifically the characters who do join your army and are talked about a lot, but aren't playable. Rodrig, Judith, Nadea, Randolph, Vladislava, Hilda's brother? Why aren't these characters playable in the second half, or at least for some of the maps? A lot of them appear in story scenes, or will be green units, only for them not to be playable. Are they supposed to be just an advisor, like Merlinus? Because guess what? Even Merlinus was playable in two games!
teams. I get that these are supposed to be big battles and where all your units are isn't the only front of the battle, and maybe some of these characters will be added via DLC like the Death Knight was, but come on, the only one who joins you is fucking Gilbert, who sucks and is ass. Reused maps. There's a lot of reused maps, not just between different routes, but across chapters, paralogs, and auxiliary battles in a single route. The game will tell you you're in a different location in Fodlin, but it'll be like the fourth or fifth time you've played this map elsewhere. Master classes are weird. Especially in a first playthrough, the game doesn't tell you what they are or their requirements until way late, and they're all cross-classed messes. A lot of them are on horses for units who previously weren't on horses. It's just like riding on a horse, ha, riding on a horse, ha, riding on a horse. Ha. Who has time to train horse and armor? Unless you plan on it from the start of the game. No, my male mages weren't training horse. I didn't know how to do that. And Crimson Flower just had to try promoting everyone right before the final chapter, even though they had like 50% chance of success, since I didn't even have enough time to train up the skills. Also, Mortal Savant is straight ass. Gender locked classes? In 2019? Also, I like everything about the new class system, except gender locked classes are stupid. It wouldn't be bad if there was a similar alternative for the other gender that learned different skills. For example, Falconite being gender locked isn't so bad, since boys can still become wyvern lords. But there's no punchy class at all for girls, and there's no grimoire alternative for boys, but they are adding new classes via DLC, so hopefully some of the classes will get covered. Endings. I'm happy that there are both non-romantic paired endings and much more paired same-sex options for endings than in any of the previous games, but I still feel like there could have been more. Like, I'm not into shipping, at all. But some of these, even I'm like, yeah, they should have been a couple, especially given their interactions during the game. Even the female professor in Edelgard's ending is decidedly vague. It's just like, oh, they worked side by side for the rest of their life. Who knows what they did behind closed doors? Just say it! They were two girls and they were fucking, it's not a big deal. No post game, what is this, Pokemon? I don't want to sound entitled, especially because there's already four storylines with 50 plus hours of content, but it'd be nice if there was a post game besides New Game Plus, like a dungeon where you could take all your jacked units and fight really powerful enemies. There's been a similar mode in a bunch of the previous Fire Emblem games, but again, if you want new content, you can just play another route, but also maybe the dungeon thing is what the new Abyss mode DLC will be. We'll find out. Final thoughts. Despite all of those nitpicks, Fire Emblem Three Houses gets my official seal of... It's a good game. So what if there are some minor problems, the pros vastly outweigh the cons, and a good game is a good game is a good game, and this is a good ass game. If you want to play a Fire Emblem game and never played one before, then play this one. If you have played Fire Emblem before, then play this one. So how do you top the latest and best entry in my favorite game series? By doing something completely new, and that's exactly what Astral Chain did, and why it's my game of the year for 2019. But this video is long enough, so surprise, it's a three-parter. In the next part, we're gonna talk about why Astral Chain is a dope game for dope people. It'll probably be out in, I don't know, a week or two, so make sure you subscribe or follow me on Twitter so you know when the next video's out. Unless you're watching this in the future, it's out now.